Dear colleagues and friends, it's a great pleasure to be back again, this time at the bus 16. And I would like to say a big thank you uh, to the Congress organizers, Professor Dimitro Zuba and um, colleagues uh, for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be part of BUS and um, I'm looking forward to see you again in Kiev. So first of all, I would like to say that I have no conflict of interest uh, besides being part in different societies and in various uh, positions um, preparing guidelines for this uh, topic. And the topic is on trauma resuscitation. What can we do with simple means? So there are a lot of topics I will cover uh, during this presentation. And uh, let's go directly into it. First of all, <clears throat> if we talk about resuscitation in trauma, we have to be aware of the difficulties and the dangers of a given environment. Um, in Ukraine, unfortunately, this uh, environment uh, during trauma care is often now a war field. So it may be dangerous where you have to work. We have to be aware that often no physicians or uh, medics are on site. So care has to be provided by the injured patient himself or his comrades or less medically educated people. Ideally, we have to treat first what kills first. Um, given that often advanced medical skills are lacking, uh, we have to uh, cope with basic measures. And uh, finally, <clears throat> it's very important to perform treatment without further injuring the patient. So avoiding a second hit injury is very important. Um, that second hit injury could be an uh, injury to rescuers um, because of attacks by the enemy or because the trainees or the rescuers are not sufficiently trained or equipped. Um, and there is not only the risk of a physical injury, but also the risk of a psychological injury. And of course, in this warfare against Russia, drones are an ever-present risk, so drones may have to be jammed to allow for a safe rescue besides shooting of the enemy, of course. So the, train, uh, the rescuers have to be trained well. They have to be sufficiently fit. So checks, health checks are important. And uh, we should also provide preventional, but also after event psychological support to the rescuers. Hemorrhage control is now the next topic I want to cover. Very importantly, and one of the most easiest methods uh, to control bleeding in extremities is the application of tourniquets. So the correct application is very important. I show you on the, ban on the banner here on the right side how a tourniquet has to be applied. Uh, and teaching this uh, correct application of tourniquets to the rescuers, especially if there are very little or have no healthcare training uh, before uh, they become rescuers, is very important to prevent injuries to the patient. Tourniquets are very helpful. They reduce the transfusion requirements in injured patients and they help to maintain the blood pressure. So. Safe use is generally spoken quite easy and it has few complications normally. And um, it is helpful, tourniquets are helpful both for the soldiers but also for civil victims with peripheral vascular injuries. Importantly, tourniquets have to be left in place only for a specific time. Afterwards, they have to be removed or opened to allow for sufficient blood flow to the periphery because they may cause ischemia to the distal limb if not opened in time. This is not always possible because of enemy fire. In the second 
lines here you see a study from Ukraine. Often more than one tourniquet has been applied and the use of tourniquets has been stretched far beyond the 60 to 120 minutes which is normally recommended and this of course may imply a risk of ischemia because of the tourniquet to the distal limb of the tourniquet. On this slide I have mentioned a very well designed and stuffed website with videos which may be interesting for teaching mainly for those uh, with basic knowledge only. Stop the bleed is a very important quotation and here we have some websites which you may access to see some basic uh, videos with basic information for the application of tourniquets. Of course practical knowledge is important beside the theory. So please train this regularly to your rescuers outside who are treating the trauma patients. Compression bandages is now the next step I will talk about. So sometimes bandages, compression bandages are important when the injury is not located on a limb but on the trunk and therefore tourniquets are not applicable. Um, in this case the wound has to be compressed with internal or external packaging. Of course in the field only external packaging is possible. Often these compression bandages are covered with or filled with pro-coagulant drugs and therefore the effect of, home of hemostasis is not only related to the pressure on the tissue but also to the pro-coagulant hemostatic factors in this tissue. These bandages are now in their fourth generation so they are very much advanced. Unfortunately until now the ideal hemostatic compression bandage has not been developed because there are still some side effects to them and they relate mainly to the development of very high temperatures during the action of these pro-coagulant factors which is due to chemical reaction and uh, because of possible vascular occlusion especially the arteries in the damaged area as we will see on the next slide. Basically there are three different types of compression bandages. The first ones are bandages which contain factor concentrators. They act quickly by absorbing water of the surrounding tissue when applied to the traumatized patient. But as mentioned before, there may be some high temperatures which may lead to secondary injuries due to burn of the tissue because of the chemical reaction in and around this compression bandage. Secondly, there are adhesive agents which clot quickly to the tissue and stop the bleeding by acting like a glue on the tissue. Of course, removing this glue again once the patient undergoes definitive, definitive surgical treatment may be difficult and cause additional tissue damage. Finally, there are pro-coagulant supplementators, which means they act similar to the first group. Again, these factors may lead to occlusion of vessels and it's not so easy often to remove these agents once the patient undergoes trauma repair surgery. Then one of the next very important factors and quite easy um, to give outside when not a lot is available 
is tranexamic acid. It has been well shown that tranexamic acid is of great importance, both, as you see here on the slides, for patients um, in the first three hours uh, with moderate to severe injury and um, for patients uh, in the first, mainly in the first three hours after, um, so of, after damage um, has been, after the damage has been caused to the, or the injury has been caused to the patient. So one gram should be given over 10 minutes and another gram, according to the CRASH-2 trial, should be given over eight hours. Of course, in this case, an IV access is required or a parenteral access is required, is required, I will come to this later because this may not be possible in the first hours after injury in the battlefield. Tranexamic acid has been studied in various, in various settings. For instance, with multiple trauma, there is a reduction in the mortality over the first month, while the risk of thromboembolism has not been increased in, uh, main, in most studies which uh, investigated tranexamic acid. Overall, the administration of tranexamic acid in multiple trauma patients leads to less mortality when given already out of hospital compared to in-hospital administration, which is usually later. However, Um, it is also important to know that for traumatic brain injury there may be advantages also with regard to reduced mortality and hemorrhage growth but the need for neurosurgery in traumatic brain injury for neurosurgery seizures and the incidence of pulmonary embolism remains comparable so both for multiple trauma but also for traumatic brain injury there seems to be a benefit for tranexamic acid uh, as for today. Also, when traumatized patients require surgery for burn injury, applying or administering tranexamic acid is of benefit because less blood is required and also less packed red blood cells have to be transfused. Some studies assessed the, the administration of two grams versus one gram of tranexamic acid in the beginning. But this higher tranexamic acid dose didn't show any benefit. So just one gram of tranexamic acid should be given. Importantly, tranexamic acid has also an effect on the outcome in children. Especially for children with war injuries in the combat setting, there seems to be a benefit, or actually there is a clear benefit, for reduced mortality once tranexamic acid is applied. Again, the risk for thromboembolic events is not increased with tranexamic acid. Very important as a measure for trauma care is analgesia. What can we do outside? Overall, it seems that ketamine is the best drug to keep the patient who is bleeding with multiple injuries or who may suffer from low blood pressure, which is detrimental with traumatic brain injury. Ketamine keeps this patient's cardiocircuitary most stable from all potent analgesics when you compare them to opioids. However, the patient may not have an IV access and administration of ketamine without IV access has not been well studied, although one can consider giving it IM, but difficult by non-medics and non-physicians, or intranasal, which again needs some basic skills. So ketamine is probably limited to physicians and uh, medics. So what can non-physicians and non-medics do out in the field? 
maybe what can the soldiers themselves do when they get injured. First of all, there is methoxyfluorine. Methoxyfluorine is a halogenated uh, anesthetic gas which has been removed from the market in most countries because of uh, renal side effects. But in, the, in um, an application over um, fluid, so by inhalation, as you see on the right bottom corner, with three milliliters over the inhaler, at least in this study with one emergency medical technician on site, the mean initial pain score uh, was reduced within 15 minutes by three points almost. No major adverse events were noted and the vital signs remained within a safe range. So this could be a very helpful addition um, and carried by soldiers for themselves or also for their friends out in the field to reduce pain. <coughs> Excuse me. And this has also been shown in various other studies that methoxyfluorine is safe and efficient. Fentanyl lozenges is another option. There are two dosages of fentanyl lozenges, one for civil and one for military use. Again, the lozenges can be given as soon as um, the team is on site. One may consider giving lozenges to the soldiers before they're getting even injured, but that may be less recommendable because fentanyl is a highly addictive agent and so having it to soldier, giving to soldiers without the need on a daily basis may be put them at risk of um, addiction. As you see here in this study, or oh, actually there are two studies, uh, but from one study very few developed uh, nausea, especially uh, when using the civil um, dosage compared to the military dosage. So fentanyl lozenges could be an option. Also there is sublingual sufentanil, but uh, that has not been studied uh, well in the military field yet. But its easy application given sublingually could be advantageous and may be considered for testing in your country. But again, a well-designed and follow-up study is required to see if this, if this could be a good option. Entonox, which is a mixture of 50% oxygen and 50% nitrous oxide, um, could be another option, but because it is given over metallic cylinders, as you see here on the right bottom of the slide, it may be more heavy to carry, more difficult to carry, and uh, not be an easy agent or option in the pre-hospital wartime environment. Some studies show that Antonox has less analgetic effects than metoxifluorine, but as you see in the lower study, this has not been proved in others. Importantly, besides pharmacological analgesia, it is essential for patients who have bone fractures, long bone fractures, to splint them and demobilize them because this reduces bleeding and pain. Of course, insulation from the wind and the cold and the wet is important, as you see here in this picture. Of course, in the wartime environment, especially if patients are still able to move themselves and one is still under enemy fire, it is important to move out of this danger zone. With multiple trauma management, the International Commission for Mountain Emergency Medicine, similarly to other societies like the European Society of Anesthesia Intensive Care, 
recommended to keep the patient warm at 37 degrees because otherwise uh, several negative effects may take place with hypothermia, as I will show you in the next slides. Thus we come to temperature control with simple means. The brain in the hypothalamus regulates temperature centrally but also peripherally with vasodilation, vasoconstriction, muscle shivering and also conscious movements and covering uh, against the cold. With trauma this is this temperature control is lost in lost in part or completely and thus the patients are prone to hypothermia with several detrimental effects to their well-being with regard to morbidity and mortality. If you look on where hypothermia can develop, we see that it can develop on site uh, of the uh, trauma, but also during transport and also during the first care in the operating theater or in the trauma department and then also along the way until the patient gets final rewarming. Of course, with our IV fluids and our medications, especially analgesia and anesthesia, we may uh, further limit or abolish thermoregulation both centrally and peripherally and therefore increase the speed with which the patient cools down. In the battlefield environment, um, the cold environment, but also the exhaustion uh, with hunger, being hungry, having less glucose, uh, being dehydrated, will bring the patient, patient's ability to thermoregulate himself sufficiently down. In the 19th, early 19th century, Napoleon, for instance, led an army, the largest of that of, uh, until that area, an army of almost 600,000 soldiers uh, towards Moscow, co uh, conquered it, but then had to retreat and besides enemy um, fire, most uh, soldiers died because of hypothermia. Only 12,000 of the 600,000 who had left uh, Central Europe came back. So accidental hypothermia is something we should try to avoid. You see here um, cooling rates in snow, fast, very fast cooling rates up to nine hours uh, um, when completely covered by snow in an avalanche. You will not see avalanches likely where you are, but importantly, uh, if what is imp what, uh, risk factors you may take into consideration is when the patient is not shivering, has an impaired consciousness level, it has very thin closing, only monolayer uh, closing, when the head and the hands are not protected and covered from the cold. And when patients are thin, then people will cool down very quickly or quicker uh, compared to the opposite. In the water, the cooling is even, even quicker, which means uh, you should avoid having patients immersed in water. Immersed means um, head and trunk still out of the water. With cooling and hypothermia, there will be less coagulation. So with less coagulation, uh, there will be also loss of red blood cells, which again will diminish uh, sufficient oxygen delivery to the peripheral tissue. This again will cause some metabolic acidosis and this again will inhibit central and peripheral thermoregulation and um, speed cooling. So this is a deadly triad of trauma and will finally um, come to, uh, the patient will finally come to death. This is a very important systematic review and it shows that with just one degree Celsius of cooling there is already increased bleeding and an increased need of red blood cell transfusions. This is a systematic review of patients with elective colorectal surgery. 
and think about patients with multiple trauma and uncontrolled bleeding, one can imagine that cooling will be faster and deeper than in this systematic review, with all its detrimental effects, of course. In this slide, you see nicely on the x-axis the first temperature measured at admission in the trauma department, while on the y-axis you see the risk or the, 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 the percentage of uh, mortality in multiple trauma patients. And these data are taken from a large registry of multiple trauma patients in North America. And um, it's easy to see that with lower core temperature, the chances of mortality increase exponentially. So there is some correlation between uh, the admission temperature of the patient and the risk of dying. Again, in this slide, uh, we see uh, the effects of hypothermia on the chances of mortality in patients on the upper side with multiple trauma. And you see in the box plot that a normal thermic patient has five times higher chances of survival compared to a no hypothermic patient, which is a patient with 35 or less degrees. Um, I may have to say that these are data from the German trauma registry. So they are also new and um, relevant. On the lower side, one can see from the same uh, data registry patients with traumatic brain injury. And again, being normothermic um, increases the likelihood of uh, survival almost 2.5 fold compared to hypothermia with a core temperature below 35 degrees Celsius. The temperature uh, also decreases platelet function. This is an experimental study with um, in vitro uh, with uh, blood taken drawn from healthy volunteers. And you see that the platelet function measured in the multiplate, which is a platelet uh, function um, testing device, decreases uh, massively almost to zero with very uh, low temperatures. Here on the polarographic microscopy, you see oconfocal imaging, as you may also say, you see also nicely that the fibrinogen um, network, so when we look at the plasmatic uh, coagulation compared to the cellular uh, coagulation in the, four, in the slide before, you see that the plasmatic coagulation um, as seen from the fibrin network, which develops, uh, a lower core temperature decreases network, fibrin network formation. And again, uh, this leads to a hypercoagulation state in hypothermia. Similarly, when measured or seen with rotation thrombolastometry, ROTEM, one can see that uh, the clot formation is limited in a hypercoagulation state. We have to be aware that whatever analgesia we grip, uh, we have an inhibition of the central but also peripheral thermoregulation. This is with regard to the peripheral thermoregulation because of vasodilation and with regard to the central uh, thermoregulation because of an uh, inhibition of the function of the hypothalamus. And patients, of course, can also shiver less, will also shiver less or at a lower temperature and will also be able to move less. So, as we have heard, it's important to keep these patients, um, of course, free of pain, but also to keep them warm. So how do we do that? So basically, uh, we should be able um, to insulate them well from the surrounding. We should also be able to estimate the temperature or measure the temperature. And um, we should avoid to further cool them down. So no 
cold diffusions outside. Analgesia kept to a significant minimum with sufficient analgesia without detrimental effects. Importantly, rewarming in the field is until now very difficult. However, the first devices with large chemical heat packs, which may be which may give us the option to maybe even rewarm or at least keep the patient's temperature stable in the out in the out of hospital area may be on the market soon. Until now we are not able to rewarm patients outside of the hospital but just limit the further cooling of the patient. So um, when we use chemical heat packs, at least until now, we are not able to rewarm the patient, but at least we keep them comfortable. Secondly, um, there is no reason to remove wet clothes as long as the body is covered in a waterproof vapor uh, barrier, which means that the damp, the water damp, stays on the body and does not um, remove further heat energy from the body. So cover the patient well, close everything airtight, water waterproof uh, tight and uh, bring him, bring them, the patients as quickly as possible to the next facility who can treat them. So this is a hypothermal burrito as shown by our colleagues in um, Canada. Cover the head, use chemical heat packs. Remember that most of the heat is lost from the backside when it is cold. So insulate the patient's back uh, from the cold bottom. And if you want to measure temperature, there are now some new devices coming on the market, like this device. Uh, the Hope Therm uh, can be um, measured with esophageal but also epitympanic probe and gives a good estimate of the core temperature. Also with patients with low core temperature below 32 degrees. New developments look like this. They come in two different types, but they are not on the market yet. This device, for instance, gives the possibility to read heart rate and also the uh, pulse oximetry and of course the core temperature. If you use such devices, be aware that you have to insulate them well from the cold environment um, and also uh, by clearing the airway from uh, cold water or snow. Um, of course, cooling may happen after trauma, but be aware uh, that this does not only happen during the cold winter season, but also uh, during uh, the warm periods of the year. So. Patients, even when injured in the warm season of the year, may cool out, so you have to protect them from the cold um, year round. This has been, for instance, shown in this study from South America, uh, sorry, South Africa, where um, patients were admitted to the emergency department and the cold temperature was taken at admission. And out of 140 patients, more than 70 had an admission core temperature of below 36 degrees, while more than 20% had even a core temperature below 35 degrees. Remember how more easily they bleed when they are colder. And interestingly, in the second line, even after half an hour of arriving in the um, trauma department, uh, the patients had an even lower um, temperature uh, to a higher um, part of, 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 uh, of the whole group. So that continued to cool down um, up to half an hour after admission. And this is also because the environment in the um, emergency department or trauma department uh, is too cold and because, uh, and they arrived cold at the emergency department because the ambulances who brought, which brought them there were not equipped sufficiently, but also because in the emergency department there was not sufficient equipment, but also awareness that patient, uh, patients are cold and will further cool down 
with the meshes taken to uh, treat them. So when you bring them to surgery, be aware that there is a hypothermia bundle um, with regard to rewarming in the pre, in, to, in the intra and in the post-operative field with three things, which are awareness, temperature measurement and rewarming techniques, which are sufficient to uh, bring the patient up to 37 degrees. Towards the end of my presentation, I would like to talk about alternative uh, ways uh, for IV access. I call them parenteral access. So uh, this is a very important take home message. The intraosseous access is more important than the peripheral vein access and more important, both are more important than the central venous access. Why is this? Intraosseous accesses are very easy to achieve. Uh, in most patients, uh, even with less uh, skilled members. Uh, there are several studies with paramedics performing intraosseous accesses uh, and in the volume depleted patient, the peripheral veins and also central venous um, vessels may not be um, well filled, but collapsed and therefore uh, the intraosseous access is preferable. If one goes for peripheral vein access, consider ultrasound guidance, but this is nothing to do um, in the field and nothing for the emergency, but more for an urgent patient, which means is there, if, there's, if it is not, um, um, let's say, a matter of uh, minutes, but a matter of um, an hour, to say, or a few hours. Importantly, in the lower study, you see also that the first pass success with an intraosseous approach is higher than with a central venous catheter. So take home message, use intraosseous success over peripheral and central venous success when you are in an emergency. I mentioned this already that ultrasound is a reasonable approach for a volume depleted patient, but this is some again nothing for the field. Uh, under warfare, but something for the hospital. And also ultrasound should be used for central veins, but also arteries because it increases the first uh, pass success. Towards the end of my presentation, I would like to say that vital parameters are very important. I will not go uh, very far into it. We know that there are three vital signs, consciousness, level, respiration um, and um, circulation. And of course, we have to keep the oxygenation of the peripheral tissue sufficiently high. We should keep uh, mean ulterior pressure map uh, also sufficiently high. We may measure the mean arterial pressure uh, radially on the artery, but also centrally on the carotid or femoral pulses. There you can measure the blood pressure down to only 60 millimeters of mercury. And of course, as mentioned before, the temperature should also be sufficiently high. Uh, I can recommend the European trauma courses uh, because these are two the courses uh, performed by the or organized by the European Resuscitation Council in cooperation with other uh, important players of, on, on the European um, level and societies. And uh, with these courses, you get a very good knowledge in two and two and a half days on the pre, but also the intra-hospital treatment of multiple trauma patients. Also, fluid resuscitation is, uh, is an important issue. I just want to say that uh, there is no benefit for fluid resuscitation in the field compared to um, restricting or folding IV fluids in the field. Uh, we have to be aware that if we give uh, rapidly fluids and a lot of fluids, the HB, hemoglobin, will decrease, which of course may bring down the oxygen delivery to a point where it may be detrimental. Um, we have to be aware that with trauma, traumatic brain injury patients, uh, balanced solutions may be detrimental because they have a um, they are hypotonic uh, and may increase brain swelling. 
And uh, finally, do not only think about the hydrostatic pressure, which you may keep up with vasopressors, but if you lose a lot of red blood cells and cellular components, do not forget to fill up the patient also again with um, colloids uh, to keep a protein um, um, content in the serum uh, with at least 5 grams per deciliter. This can, for instance, be achieved with 20% um, concentrated albumin. Finally, a timely transport has to be organized to a place where definitive surgical care can be accomplished. We require a trauma network behind the combat zone or also in the civil field. And we require, of course, also sufficient fast transport uh, vehicles. Interestingly, the US Army was able to decrease the number of fatalities from 40 to 50 in the Second World War and in the Korean War down to below five in the last wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And this was mainly possible uh, also because of all the measures I've mentioned to you and also very fast transport with terrestrial but also helicopter-borne vehicles. Rewarming in the hospital should aggressively be achieved and as quickly as possible up to 37 degrees, of course not uh, by overshooting with the temperature. You should uh, use a massive transfusion protocol in your hospital. Um, here on the right lower side in the yellow box uh, marked with a red arrow, I've given you some uh, aims uh, where you should uh, uh, target um, the parameters too, like Hb, don't forget the calcium, uh, don't forget the pH, uh, don't um, forget the temperature as measured, as mentioned, and other parameters. In the hospital, of course, we need definitive surgical care. We try to restore the circulating blood volume, uh, for instance, for most uh, Hb of 8 gram per deciliter should be sufficient, especially for uh, surgical uh, patients and trauma patients young ones and healthy ones. And uh, one has to be aware that there is no general agreement whether to use more coagulation factors or to use uh, fresh frozen plasma. Um, but uh, most European countries now have moved to a point of care um, treatment with coagulation factors, um, supplementing the tranexamic acid, which we have mentioned before. There are some open issues like um, how do we, if and how do we perform coagulation management in the field. There are some studies with fibrinogen going on or um, pro-thromblex um, components. Um, rewarming has to be considered uh, how to be faster and quicker. And most studies conclude correctly that we need more prospective data uh, on many of these issues I mentioned in these slides. So finally, if you want to have more knowledge on uh, pre-hospital uh, treatment in a difficult environment, I may recommend you this book, uh, which has been published recently. And to conclude, pre-hospitally, we should be aware of the environment and uh, avoid secondary injuries. We should stop the bleeding uh, as quickly as possible and stop the bleeding, which is which kills. Stop also treat first. What stops? Uh, um, stop first what kills first uh, analgesia is very important temperature control um, has been mentioned we are aware that we cannot rewarm but just limit uh, pre-hospital cooling um, at this point if you need an access alternatively to the IV line go for intraosseous transport the patient quickly to definitive surgical care Rewarm the patient uh, up to 37 degrees and refill him uh, as required uh, with a massive transfusion protocol adapted to your um, regional environment. Ideally, supplementing it with point of care uh, coagulation monitoring. So thank you so much. This is all for now. And if you have any questions, please feedback to me. Thank you and all the best.